So my name is Brittany Wright. My pronouns are they, them, and I am the Community Engagement Consultant for the Bureau of Library Development. And with me is Emily Hart, the E-Rate and Connected Director Connections <laughs> Consultant. Thank you, Brittany. We are so excited to bring this webinar to you guys today. Speaking today, we have Dustin Lee, the Special Programs Director for the Information Technology Disaster Resource Center. He is a graduate of Berkeley. He has worked with the United Nations and he is a self-described connectivity geek. He'll be talking about some of the resources that the ITDRC has to offer for libraries and communities in the wake of natural disasters. We also have Johnny Handy, who is the Florida State Coordinator for the ITDRC. He currently resides in Lake City with his wife and four daughters and has worked in the communications and IT sector for 20 years. He also works with his local county fire department and on the school board. Dustin? Hey everyone, it is great to be with all of you today. Uh, thank you, uh, Brittany, Daryl, and Emily uh, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, so uh, like they said, uh, I am the Special Programs Director for uh, the Information Technology Disaster Resource Center. Uh, I'll usually just say ITDRC because it's a lot uh, faster to say than, than our full name, but I know it's kind of a mouthful, so I'll just keep saying the acronym until people sort of start to get it. Uh, we've also got uh, Johnny Handy with us, um, uh, like uh, they said, and uh, Johnny is actually um, in uh, our Florida State Coordinator in, in Florida proper um, and, and will probably be um, interfacing uh, with a lot of you if uh, you're interested in, in the disaster response stuff that we do. Um, but what I wanted to do for this, uh, uh, this webinar was to just share a little bit about um, who we are as an organization, uh, but especially, uh, hopefully by the end of this uh, presentation, um, all of you will have an understanding of what kind of resources we have to offer, uh, especially around disaster relief um, and how we can help uh, your communities and your patrons. Um, uh, and uh, so what kind of tech that we do, um, what kind of communications uh, we provide, uh, and, uh, and how everything that we do is, is at no cost uh, to those communities. Um, so um, we do also have a piece of this that's kind of related to the uh, our COVID-19 package uh, where um, we are uh, installing uh, outdoor Wi-Fi um, to support uh, remote learning uh, and uh, to support uh, communities who may need access to the internet. Um, and we've been doing this uh, across the country uh, for uh, hundreds of sites, uh, especially around schools and libraries, um, providing free outdoor Wi-Fi or and, and even expanding Wi-Fi inside. So we'll talk about that during this presentation as well. Um, and then I guess the, the last piece of this is also uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, our volunteers and um, how you or your patrons or communities can get involved um, in efforts like this um, if you're so inclined. Um, I do also uh, want to invite uh, questions uh, during this presentation. Um, I know Daryl has offered to help um, uh, facilitate some of these questions, uh, but, but certainly you're welcome to throw them in chat. I'll try to keep an eye on chat, but hopefully Daryl can also help me. Um, um, uh, voice some questions if I don't see them. Uh, but I, I definitely encourage us to be uh, interactive uh, and, and happy to, to take and answer questions uh, as we go along uh, in this uh, today's webinar. So what are we? Um, so so uh, besides this very long uh, name and an acronym, what is ITDRC? Um, so we're actually a 501c3. Um, we're, we're national. Uh, we, we operate uh, across um, most of the states and territories uh, in the U.S. and also occasionally internationally as well. Um, we're actually headquartered in North Texas, uh, and we are really a volunteer-driven uh, nonprofit. So uh, about 2,800 volunteers, and we'll have a graph on, on how we've grown over the last uh, few years. But uh, most of, of what we, we wouldn't be able to do what we what we do uh, without all the volunteers, including Johnny, um, uh, who is in this webinar with us. 
Um, so we are really, a, a, we've become a trusted resource to emergency managers, uh, to disaster relief organizations and to the tech community as well. Um, so we help to facilitate a lot of um, technology uh, use uh, in disaster deployments. So, um, and we help to connect uh, the, the folks who have been impacted by disasters um, with the tech uh, that they need to, to kind of get through it, uh, to respond and to recover um, from, from disasters. Um, so uh, I'll have some more slides about what exactly these disasters are, uh, but uh, I think hurricanes, um, I mean, Florida, I guess most of you unfortunately are familiar uh, with hurricanes uh, and the impact they have on infrastructure. And just imagine um, losing your, your, uh, your cell service um, or uh, your power um, and your ability to um, make a call um, to your family and, and, uh, and uh, tell them that, that you're okay or where to meet. Um, or the ability to um, submit uh, FEMA documentation so that you can start to recover um, from, from the impacts of a, of a large-scale disaster like that. Um, so um, if you don't have those resources, the, the communications bits of it, uh, it becomes really difficult to, to do that. So we, that's kind of our role, and we, we will step in and uh, provide emergency communications infrastructure uh, often or tech in general to, su to support the response. Um, so sometimes that's internet, sometimes that's computers, and we'll talk more about what those resources are. So speaking of which, um, internet and Wi-Fi. So, so that is probably the most commonly requested resource that we, we provide. Um, again, everything that you see on this slide, we, everything that we do is actually free. Uh, so, so there's no cost to any of our services, but um, for, uh, for disasters, oftentimes, you know, sometimes we're supporting um, firefighters uh, who are responding to a wildfire um, and they need uh, communications to um, uh, to coordinate their their response efforts uh, to the wildfire. Sometimes we're, we're, we're supporting search and rescue so that they can get um, uh, resources that they need uh, uh, pulled into an area where they're searching uh, uh, for um, uh, for survivors. Um, but uh, all of that really depends on having a commun communications line to the outside world. Uh, and uh, internet and Wi-Fi is the way that everything works today. So, so that's what we do. Um, so internet, uh, we'll sometimes bring in satellite-based internet, sometimes cellular-based internet, uh, and put Wi-Fi on top of that. But the next piece of this is, is also uh, phones and charging stations. So everyone's got a cell phone today. Um, but uh, they're really no good if you don't have power for them. So uh, we, we do um, provide uh, charging stations quite often, for example, in Hurricane Ida um, that, that impacted uh, the Louisiana area recently. Um, they lost, uh, many areas lost power for quite a while and, and a lot of uh, folks needed to charge their, their phones so that they could, they could start doing that recovery uh, that we just talked about. Uh, uh, start filling in those FEMA forms, start contacting their families, start figuring out what they need to do for insurance and things like that. Um, so um, we provide free charging stations. Um, we also provide uh, landline phones um, as well. Um, typically, these are set up as phone banks, for example, um, for the emergency managers um, and sometimes in shelters as well. Um, laptop and tablets, uh, we do have uh, uh, some of these available. Uh, typically, um, we'll set them up in a public space, um, similar to what uh, many libraries have set up for the patrons. Like, you know, we'll have a bank of, of laptops so that people can start filling in those, those FEMA forms and get back on their email uh, and things like that. But also for, um, for the first responders, uh, for the public safety, for fire, um, EMS, um, oftentimes they need extra devices to help manage an incident. Uh, printers. Um, <laughs> I keep going back to FEMA forms, but but uh, there there are a lot of uh, uh, processes which, for some reason, are still on paper. Um, so we do provide printers for that as well. Um, and handheld radios, uh, walkie talkies. Um, uh, a lot of uh, man emergency managers need those. Um, uh, I, I forgot to mention. So so laptops. Um, so this is actually a, a picture from uh, our COVID response uh, where. We were supporting uh, a medical clinic um, that was uh, uh, um, uh, set up uh, around around COVID. So um, they uh, obviously use these. Just judging by the labels that they put on these on these uh, uh, Chromebooks that we provided, um, they were using these uh, uh, in the in the ICU and in the PACU. Um, so uh, that's that's a great use of of our resources as well. Um, Radios I already talked about, and then 
um, mobile command centers. Uh, so I'll, you can see in, in this photo, uh, some of our mobile command centers. Uh, so this is our logo here, but you can see um, this is our mobile tech unit too. Um, we have a couple of field support service units. Um, and basically we can create a, an office space um, in, in a disaster area. So uh, oftentimes this gets used by public safety agencies, by, uh, emergency managers, um, the Red Cross and other relief organizations uh, and industry partners as well um, who are conducting emergency operations uh, responses. Um, this is actually a, a photo inside of our largest uh, uh, asset, um, our uh, mobile tech unit. And as you can see, it's got a, a number of screens. This, this is actually a photo from Dallas when we had it set up for the um, mass vaccination site there. Um, and uh, we have satellite TV on a couple of screens. We've got the schedule. We've got stats on how many vaccinations are going in. We've got some uh, uh, video feeds so that we can monitor the traffic uh, in, in and around the, the mass vaccination site. Um, so, uh, so yeah, this is a really useful when you need to have a, um, a workspace uh, to to operate in, and you don't want to have to deal with the you know the rain coming down, and you have all the tech already kind of pre set up for you. Uh, and, and again, everything that we do um, is is uh, at no cost, uh, being a nonprofit. Um, this is just another view of our fleet assets. So we we do have a bunch of service vehicles um, uh, up in the upper left corner here. Um, most of these are um, being used today for our COVID response, um, where we're doing uh, these um, public uh, Wi-Fi community hotspot uh, installations across the country. Um, and then uh, we do have some more kind of um, niche assets, uh, whether they're the mobile command centers um, or the uh, Wi-Fi hotspot trailers. Um, we can plant this in the parking lot, for example. It's solar powered, and self-contained, and we can basically drop it off and leave it, and there's Wi-Fi there. The next few slides are really around uh, just a few examples of the disaster responses that we have done uh, recently. Um, so obviously Hurricane, Hurricane Ida um, uh, sticks in our mind uh, just as being a, a really large uh, hurricane that, that we spent uh, quite a bit of time on this year. Um, I think we peaked around 94 individual sites. Um, so oftentimes um, for one particular disaster like Hurricane Ida, um, we'll actually set up multiple uh, points of connectivity, multiple points of power, um, multiple areas where we're putting in laptops or printers. Um, so uh, in, in Hurricane Ida, this is one of our larger ones um, where we set up, set up uh, 94 different uh, uh, sites. So whether they're at fire stations, uh, at shelters, um, at medical centers, um, providing things like uh, the Wi-Fi access point that you see here in the fire station. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's a really great, great example. And again, I know Florida gets unfortunately impacted by hurricanes quite often. Um, so uh, I, we are certainly a resource for this. Um, and at the very end of this slide deck, um, uh, I'll have a, a number of contact points for us, but really we encourage anyone who has a need um, uh, or, or sees a need uh, to get a hold of us, um, and uh, we're happy to uh, support in um, uh, however we can with with our technology, with our volunteers, um, or even just our expertise. Um, just a little bit uh, before Hurricane Ida, um, we were also uh, working on the earthquake in Haiti. Um, so um, this is kind of near and dear to me because I, I went out here with with uh, one of our field teams. Um, so one of the things that we provided here uh, was uh, satellite communications because infrastructure was, um, it wasn't actually damaged by the earthquake so much, but it just didn't exist in a lot of the areas that were um, severely impacted uh, by, by, the, uh, uh, by that earthquake. So there were a lot of buildings that were damaged. Um, and uh, this was actually a photo from a medical clinic that was being stood up in a very re remote area. Um, so they had a lot of patients that were coming in. Uh, and the doctors, like you see in the left uh, here, um, needed a way to um, uh, communicate with his home base, um, uh, request medical supplies, just check in for, for safety. Um, and then on the right side here, we also had a, a temporary uh, internet uh, Wi-Fi access point. Um, so this is actually a satellite-based dish um, and, and the way that we were able to get internet into that uh, remote area. 
Um, the handheld radios, again, uh, super useful for, for being able to call down a mountain without having to traverse uh, or really ford a river um, and, uh, and, and make a multi-hour journey to, to uh, relay a message down there. Um, so we provided a number of radios, uh, handheld radios for that as well. Um, last year, uh, there was also a, a dam failure uh, in Michigan, uh, in the Midland area. Um, and you can see the kind of the destruction from the dam failure. So water, water kind of, um, uh, because the dam failed, water rushed uh, and kind of spilled over the embankments and um, and w washed out this road, as you can see. And also caused a lot of issues with um, uh, lack of potable water in the area, since most of the water supplies were were well based. Um, and uh, and also they caused a lot of infrastructure damage. Um, so that the emergency operations center um, it was relocated to a temporary uh, building. Uh, and they didn't have internet there and they need to get internet there. So we provided that. Um, you can see one of our volunteers here actually on a, a, a ladder here trying to put uh, um, a wireless link relay on a grain silo. Um, so we'll, we'll do kind of whatever, it need, whatever, whatever we need to do uh, in order to get um, uh, internet connectivity from one area to another. So sometimes uh, we'll use a, a relay like this, a wireless relay like this. Sometimes we'll use satellite, sometimes we'll use cellular. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll work with uh, the, the ISPs to, um, uh, to support. And we actually have a number of great relationships um, with most of the uh, telcos uh, and, and the service providers. Um, so we're kind of a trusted resource for them to be able to funnel the, the, their response efforts in, in the right directions as well. Um, also last year, uh, there were wildfires in Washington. Actually, that last year and this year, um, we responded to multiple wildfires in Washington. But but this photo in particular is is from uh, from last year, um, where this was actually one of the first deployments of Starlink. So I don't know if any of you have been tracking, but um, uh, SpaceX has been developing a new satellite constellation. Um, really exciting because it's kind of a game changer in terms of where you can get internet connectivity and what kind of speeds you can get out of that. Um, so, uh, anyways, we we, were, we partnered with uh, the state of Washington, um, put in Wi-Fi um, phones and, and uh, power, as you can see here. Um, another hurricane uh, from from last year uh, in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, you can see a lot of blown up windows in these in these buildings. Um, and we also worked with the school systems there to assess the state of their networks after the hurricane had impacted uh, them. They were trying to get kids uh, back into school as quickly as possible. So uh, we had our volunteers uh, like Asher here um, go through the schools, uh, work with the, their IT um, staff and figure out, you know, what was viable, um, what what was still standing, what servers were still there um, uh, and uh, and what we could do to, to help bring some of that back. Um, this is a fire camp uh, in California. So each of these tents um, is actually for, for firefighters working on the front line uh, of the Manocena com complex fire. Um, and uh, they needed a, a network, to, again, to coordinate their emergency operations, uh, as well as um, for um, many of these firefighters, they were on, they've been on the front lines or they've been on the front lines for, for weeks or months. Uh, and they want they needed a way to kind of sustain their 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 morale. Um, so we kind of provide that provide connectivity as a morale network as well. Um, and then uh, this is, again, our, our mobile tech unit. Uh, we do have uh, um, satellite internet on here, uh, Wi-Fi, um, as well as TV. Um, so uh, here are a couple of examples of a satellite issues that we might use. Um, and then an example of the type of charging station that we might set up. So uh, we've got a lot of these kind of uh, charging banks here. Uh, and uh, every, every day after the firefighters came back, um, they would all kind of go plug in their their phones because as as you can imagine, uh, not a lot of power uh, in these tents um, to to uh, charge things up. So um, yeah, we have also started working on imagery. Um, so working with the emergency managers to um, provide uh, imaging of the areas that have been affected by disasters. So um, having to traditionally how this is done is um, emergency managers will task someone to uh, drive down these roads uh, and just survey, you know, this house is down, this house is down, this house is down. Um, and it's, as you can imagine, it's a very slow process, especially when there are um, trees that are lying across these roads or other debris. 
um, and then you have to clear the debris first, and then you have to uh, send someone physically from 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 site to site. Um, so what we've been doing uh, is all providing some drone uh, imagery uh, to assess the state of of the uh, impacted areas uh, relatively quickly without having to send someone physically uh, on site and, and put the, uh, put them at risk as well. So um, we are kind of um, uh, again a trusted resource uh, on uh, for tech, um, whether it's the Wi-Fi or, or even more kind of cutting edge. Uh, stuff uh, like uh, drone imagery. And just another wildfire from, from Washington where we were supporting um, wireless uh, um, in the area that the, uh, they're operating in the area that, that there wasn't cell coverage um, because one of the cell towers had been burned up by the wildfire. Um, so we helped to restore the connectivity to that cell tower um, and provide uh, connectivity to the firefighters there. Uh, again, a, a more recent one, um, the Afghan refugee resettlement. Um, so as uh, many of you know, uh, quite a few refugees have come um, over to uh, the, the U.S. from Afghanistan. Um, and uh, many of them have uh, been temporarily housed at uh, forts uh, across the country. Um, and they've set up these these kind of tent cities uh, in these areas. Um, and um, just kind of imagine that, that you've been you know, displaced from your home, sent to another country, um, and you know, you, you maybe you have a cell phone, but you don't, you certainly don't have like AT and T or Verizon or T Mobile or or um, or any connectivity to uh, to um, to be connected to the outside world. Um, and uh, so, what we have been providing uh, at these uh, uh, um, resettlement camps. Is is Wi-Fi for the refugees, um, as well as for some of the nonprofits that have been helping to respond uh, to this crisis. Um, so uh, this is actually one of our biggest networks. We 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 have um, uh, thousands and thousands of refugees on our Wi-Fi um, each day, um, passing gigabits and terabytes of uh, of, of information, um, so that they can connect back to their families um, who may still be in Afghanistan. Um, as well as to plan out, you know, what are the next steps uh, after they, they, they get here? Um, many of them are being resettled to cities uh, across the, the U.S. Um, and being able to find the community uh, in the area, being able to find jobs. I mean, that's that's uh, um, that's having Wi-Fi uh, and communications for that is is really really important and critically important for for them. Um, and then our COVID response. Uh, so uh, I'll talk a lot more about our COVID response as we go along. But this is a, a photo from one of the mass vaccination sites. You can see the, the massive uh, vehicles here lined up to get their vaccinations. Um, and uh, so again, we we supported uh, the Dallas Fire and Rescue folks who were kind of running the site um, with a mobile command center, uh, Wi-Fi, video, and radios. Um, we also, very early on in the pandemic, um, we set up a connectivity at this quarantine uh, area in San Bernardino. So this was kind of interesting because this was like way back in the beginning. Um, I know it's been like a really long year and a half or, or almost almost two years since this whole pandemic thing started. Um, but this, this was kind of like the very beginning where we, we didn't really know what, what COVID was going to turn into. Um, so this was kind of interesting because we got brought into uh, put in Wi-Fi for one of the, the first large kind of mass quarantine areas um, for uh, um, it's actually largely for uh, you know um, people coming off of cruise ships like this um, and we were setting up uh, um, both kind of tablets and Wi-Fi um, for people to um, reconnect to the outside world. Uh, we also set up a, a connectivity for testing centers um, so that uh, you know nurses and and uh, um, other medical staff could could keep track of you know who was being tested and um, and uh, could access patient records um, on online. Um, so it looks like we've, we just got like tons and tons of photos, um, but uh, obviously Hurricane Michael is is close to um, many of you. Um, so this is this is one of the examples of where we did drone imagery. Um, we actually surveyed damage uh, uh, for all of the county fire stations. Um, and then for the Mexico Beach Fire Department, um, that fire station was actually destroyed. Um, so we provided uh, emergency con connectivity, um, so Wi-Fi and internet, uh, as well as uh, satellite TV in the temporary fire station 
Um, and that I was actually running for 18 months. So um, some of the sites that we do, um, you know, we're in and out um, because the um, we'll put in some temporary infrastructure, some temporary Wi-Fi, uh, and then you know the power comes back or the fiber comes back, and and then we'll we'll pull our equipment back. But sometimes it takes a lot longer um, for things to come back to normal. So this is one of those cases um, where we had equipment in there for for um, uh, more than 18 months. This is another um, a photo from Hurricane Michael. Um, and uh, this is a base camp for first responders. Um, so it was 2000 beds uh, for um, just for first responders. So this was uh, organizations like FEMA, uh, Red Cross, Salvation Army, National Guard, law enforcement. So you can imagine kind of the scale of the, of the response. And I know many of you kind of lived through that. Um, uh, so what we did here was um, we provided the, um, the internet and the Wi-Fi um, to make sure that, again, the first responders uh, uh, and the impacted populations had access to the internet so that they could get their jobs done. Uh, and, and of course, uh, there's a morale piece of it as well. Uh, many first responders, you know, they, they go out into these um, uh, uh, camps for, for weeks or months at a time, and uh, it's nice for them to be able to call back home once in a while. Um, and then another, my last photo from, from Hurricane Michael, uh, this is actually a wastewater treatment site um, that they had on a uh, industrial control system. And unfortunately, they actually lost their fiber, uh, fiber ring around this area, um, uh, which meant that they lost the ability to monitor the system. So um, they were actually using a lot of human resources just to uh, keep people on site and physically monitoring the system. Uh, um, because the internet had gone down for them. Um, so, I mean, these are resources that could have been out um, uh, uh, helping uh, with um, uh, anything from uh, uh, donations, coordinations, or, or uh, traffic management to um, uh, emergency management, search and rescue. Um, but they had to be stuck at this wastewater treatment site because they had lost the internet. So uh, what, we, what we did was we helped them to bring their, their wastewater treatment plant back online. Um, with a wireless uh, uh, wireless shot um, to part of their fiber that hadn't been destroyed yet. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we, we, we work closely with um, local and state governments all the time uh, on these sorts of things. So moving on from Hurricane Michael, um, the uh, Project Connect uh, is also very near and dear to my heart because uh, this is what I spend most of my time working on um, for the last uh, year and a half. Um, Project Connect is our effort to bring public Wi-Fi to the community. Um, as librarians, uh, I'm, I'm sure you are really familiar with this, um, but uh, one of the stories that, that we heard um, very early on was that there were um, uh, community members who were, at the beginning of this pandemic, um, all the libraries closed, uh, or many of the libraries closed, and, and they patrons couldn't get into libraries. So many of the patrons who, who relied on these libraries uh, for the internet, um, they were kind of pressed up against the walls of the library or sitting sitting next to the front door, um, trying to get that little bit of bleed out of Wi-Fi coming from that building. Um, so um, it wasn't it wasn't ideal. And, and we saw this over and over again. And, and, and a lot of different organizations asked us, you know, is there something that we can do to, to help with this? And, and of course, being geeks and, and techs, uh, we're like, sure, yeah, of course. And we can, we can put Wi-Fi outside of these buildings and extend the um, footprint of the Wi-Fi um, beyond the boundaries of, of the walls of, of the libraries and schools, um, even while these facilities are shut for COVID-19. Um, and um, so we, we've actually now done this uh, across the, the country. Um, this, is, this is a photo from uh, California. This is actually taken um, during a wildfire as well as uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, but uh, you can see that there's a little Wi-Fi antenna sitting on the, on the edge of this community center here, um, looking over a parking lot where they had a fire truck and another Wi-Fi access point um, sitting uh, outside. Um, but, uh, but this is kind of a, a snapshot of um, of some of the site project connect sites that we've done uh, across the country. Um, so each one of these green dots kind of represents a library or a community facility that has um, where we've uh, partnered to, to extend their Wi-Fi 
um, outside the boundaries of their walls or, or extend their, their Wi-Fi um, into sort of like, like a co-working space or something like that. Um, so we partnered actually quite a bit with the state of Washington. Um, so you, you might have seen quite a few dots in the Northwest. Um, but uh, uh, with the state of Washington's help um, uh, or the partnership, we, we installed Wi-Fi across um, almost all of their schools. Um, we, we put Wi-Fi outside their schools um, and even in these kind of very remote parking lots. Um, but also like at some of these super, super remote uh, free libraries. Um, so there, um, this was basically, you know, you know, in a very, very small town of like a hundred. Um, so not a lot there, um, but uh, we were able to get uh, Wi-Fi um, and internet to this, to this and then put Wi-Fi on top of that um, for the community. So sometimes, you know, there just aren't a lot of options. There isn't necessarily uh, a McDonald's or Starbucks um, in every city, especially in these very rural areas um, where, where uh, public Wi-Fi is available. So being able to bring um, connectivities to students who need to get online for uh, remote learning, um, bring connectivity to um, patrons who are looking for um, employment resources, uh, who are um, looking for access to telemedicine, um, voting, census registration. Um, I'm sure all of you know much better than, than I do, um, but the, the, the internet is, has really become essential to, um, to daily life. Um, and uh, that's been our kind of goal with Project Connect to help to to bridge that divide, um, especially around COVID. Um, when this when we first started, it was our focus was really on the COVID piece of it. Um, but uh, you know, over time, we've kind of Project Connect has become more of a um, digital divide uh, program, uh, trying to bridge that that gap, um, both the homework gap and the the divide for the the population in general. But even even beyond the rural areas, um, even in in uh, this is a photo from from central Detroit um, and one of the schools there uh, where um, there, there there's really an affordability issue as well. So um, many residences, they just don't have Internet at home, not necessarily because there isn't infrastructure in the area, um, but but largely because it's just not um, affordable for them to uh, to pay for. Um, so what we have done in, in many of these cases is partner with schools and libraries uh, and nonprofits to um, uh, establish these kind of community Wi-Fi hotspots. You can barely see uh, a Wi-Fi hotspot in the, in the left there, just left of, the, of our truck and above our ladder. Um, but uh, we put these uh, oftentimes in green spaces um, uh, inside of pavilions uh, next to picnic tables. Um, really anywhere it makes sense for communities um, to to have this uh, as a public resource. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So Puerto Rico, um, we also partnered with quite a few schools and libraries in Puerto Rico. And actually, we have an ongoing project with uh, Libraries Without Borders to establish additional sites um, on the island uh, and make sure that there is also um, disaster resiliency. Um, so the libraries, um, have sort of become uh, uh, these community centers um, beyond uh, beyond the books. Um, of, of course, the internet piece of it, but also just the uh, um, kind of like a rally point for for the community to come to um, after a hurricane like Hurricane Maria. Um, so having communications at these at disaster resiliency centers that these libraries are turning into. Um, it was really important uh, so that uh, they have a way to, um, again, contact their families, contact the authorities to let them know, you know, that, you know, that there um, that there's a lot of damage in the area. Um, and um, uh, and of course, to help to bridge that gap so that, uh, again, um, families who may not uh, have any infrastructure in the area uh, or may not be able to afford it um, still have a way to get online, uh, ensure the kids get a good education. Um, and uh, and all the economic opportunities that go along with that. Um, we've also done some installations in um, uh, in low income housing, for example, in the uh, in New York City's um, housing complexes. Um, so these are photos um, where the uh, the Department of uh, um, uh, Community Development, Youth and Community Development, they were setting up. Uh, co-working spaces for kids to get online. Um, so it was kind of like a cross between childcare and uh, online learning. 
uh, and they needed Wi-Fi inside these spaces. So um, we were able to set that up for them. Um, and then the next few slides are just lots and lots of uh, uh, examples of some of the libraries that we've done. Uh, one of the first ones was the Plattsboro Library in Texas. Um, uh, but we also, for example, did uh, libraries in Vermont uh, with the Windsor Library um, in Pennsylvania. Um, and and uh, this is another one <laughs> where we did a library in Puerto Rico again. Um, so we've done far over 200 uh, libraries. Um, so this is a little bit more recent to a picture of where we are. Um, but each again, each one of these green dots represents the site that we currently have open today. Um, so, uh, and the red dots represent sites where we did a disaster response in the past, um, and uh, and then we were able to uh, recover the equipment. Um, but as you can tell, we have quite a lot going on um, across the country. Um, and um, part of the reason that I'm on this webinar with you all today is that we would love to help um, and and bring some of the, these resources to bear um, in Florida. You can you can tell that we still have some sites available open um, in the um, uh, in the areas that were impacted by Hurricane Michael. Um, but, uh, you know, if there's something that we can do uh, for, for Project Connect uh, to help to bridge that divide for, for you all, um, that's something that we'd love to be able to do. Um, and another example of a library, another library, we just have, I guess, a lot of libraries um, uh, in, this, in this deck. But uh, I do want to kind of get towards the end of this deck. Um, I know I've got a lot of slides going on um, and save some time for questions as well. Um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat um, uh, as I as I keep going through these uh, through these slides. Um, so I guess one one question that we often get is, okay, so how do we how do we request um, resources? Um, so if it's around Project Connect, um, itdrc.org/project-connect is the best way to get started. Um, we have a pretty extensive um, uh, frequently asked questions document there. Um, and uh, there is also a form there to request a site if you're um, interested in setting up a public Wi-Fi um, access point. Um, again, everything that we do is free of charge. There's no cost uh, to our services. Um, uh, we are, uh, as a nonprofit, we are grant funded. So, um, so there's, there's, uh, um, and, and it's pretty turnkey. Um, there's not a lot um, to it. Um, we'll send a, a volunteer or a crew out there um, to with the hardware and the cable and everything necessary um, to do these installations uh, for, for libraries and schools. And then uh, just quickly some stats on, uh, on who, where we are as an organization. So um, we, as I mentioned, we have about 2,800 volunteers um, as of October. So we're actually a little bit over this now. Um, and uh, almost uh, 1,800 sites. Um, and we've grown quite a bit. Um, this huge spike here is really our COVID response uh, around Project Connect, uh, as well as uh, Hurricane Ida. Um, and then uh, sometimes we also get asked, you know, how do we prioritize our resources? Um, so we usually focus first on life safety. Um, so anything that's related to um, medical services, um, search and rescue, fire response, critical infrastructure, like the wastewater treatment. Um, plants and um, that kind of gets prioritized first and then we we go to mass care like shelters um, uh, survivor reunification things like things like that um, and then uh, community recovery um, where we oftentimes put in connectivity and laptops um, at uh, uh, donations management sites volunteer sites um, and uh, and then long-term recovery um, where uh, we sometimes help with um, uh, the like small business recovery, uh, social services, um, uh, and uh, and uh, community and education facilities as well. Um, so I already kind of talked about what our mission is, um, but the uh, we've got volunteers across um, the ten our ten regions in the U.S., uh, Puerto Rico, um, and actually other territories as well. Um, and we have these packaged up. Uh, we have our equipment kind of packaged up in. And rapidly deployable caches, so we can get them out pretty quickly. Um, even even uh, um, Oconus outside of the continental U.S., um, we can get to gear, um, for example, to Haiti or to Puerto Rico or to Hawaii. Um, but uh, you know, for states like Florida, um, it's we can, sometimes as easy as driving um, one of our mobile mobile command vehicles uh, or mobile tech units um, over uh, over to the impacted area. 
We are also a volunteer driven organization. So volunteers are of course always welcome. Um, if, if you are interested or maybe your patrons are interested, um, whether you are a techie uh, and interested in the networking side or the software side, um, or maybe you are a radio uh, person, a ham, um, and want to exercise your um, radio skills, um, we, we do have a lot of uh, both um, um, software network folks as well as radio folks. And we actually have a whole Slack channel dedicated to radio um, and actually to a lot of kind of niche um, tech stuff. Um, so if you become a volunteer, you'll get to join our, our Slack uh, workspace um, and where we coordinate all of our, all our, all our um, disaster responses, um, but also get to meet a lot of really other uh, great, great volunteers and great people um, who you might have some shared interests with as well. Um, even if you're not a techie, uh, we do also uh, have a lot of volunteers who help us with our uh, administrative side, our project management side, um, keeping all our um, equipment uh, sorted out, our logistics. Um, so there are the opportunities uh, for um, non-techies as well um, uh, in, in those areas in marketing and and really, um, we're, you know, we're, we're a standard organization, so there's always going to be things to do um, beyond the tech as well. Then uh, Dustin, Emily asks, what about libraries that have drone programs or clubs? That is a great question. Um, so libraries that have drone programs or clubs, um, I think it would be interesting to um, maybe just do like an introduction. Like we could, we could, we could do uh, um, like a, a meeting with with that drone program or club and and make the folks who are uh, in in those clubs aware of what IDRC does and and conversely help us become aware of, of what they do. Um, so that you know when a disaster hits, um, they they know that they can call on us, uh, and we know that maybe we can call on them if they are um, even closer to the disaster. Um, and, and if you know if they're interested in joining up with us, uh, uh, if they're interested in volunteering with us, I think that would be a great opportunity as well. Um, so uh, support at itdrc.org is our um, our email, uh, and I'll have a slide at the end with that email address on there as well. Um, and that's probably the best way to get a hold of us um, for um, for kind of general uh, interests uh, questions uh, like that. So thanks for thanks for uh, bringing that up, Daryl and Emily. Um, we have lots of different types of assets as well. Um, so if you're in emergency management, you might know what DIMMs type one, two, three, and four are. But basically, they're different different sizes of of uh, assets uh, depending on the scale of the disaster. Um, and then we have, we have a lot of folks who are trained in, in different specialties, um, whether it's incident command system, um, incident management, uh, communications, um, or uh, auxiliary communications. Um, and then uh, this is just a photo of some of our, um, our rapidly deployable caches. Um, so we can ship these pretty easily. We have a lot of great partnerships um, with, uh, um, with carriers and foundations to help us to get uh, place, things places they need to go in disasters. Um, and uh, some of those assets include um, uh, voice data infrastructure, like phones, like we talked about, uh, notebooks and tablets, servers, printers, Wi-Fi, uh, LTE, cellular connectivity, um, handheld radios, uh, satellite programming. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we can do. Um, one of the things that I think libraries might be most interested in are, uh, are what we can do to help survivors or, or their patrons uh, after disasters. Um, so many times, you know, we support um, like the shelters and reunification centers where we're putting in these public computers and telephones and Wi-Fi and, and TVs and charging stations so that, again, that these, these people who have been impacted by disasters have a way to get out um, uh, to communicate with the outside world um, when, you know, when the cell towers are down or when they don't have cable internet or when they don't have the internet from their homes. Um, so we'll, we'll do a lot of these temp kind of temporary installations to support survivors. Uh, we also support the uh, NGOs who are working inside. So whether it's Salvation Army or Team Rubicon or the Red Cross, um, they often need uh, both compute devices as well as the connectivity to organize their responses. Um, and then uh, again, we support emergency managers um, who are providing the emergency services um, as well as public safety um, and even sometimes like the animal call centers, 
um, they'll often go down during disasters. Um, so uh, if we can help to bring them back up, that's that's one of the things that we often do as well. Um, and then our team, again, is, is a lot of different volunteers from a lot of different backgrounds, but some of them are network engineering, some of them specialize in voice, some of them specialize in wireless um, satellite, Sometimes they specialize in the drone imagery. So uh, the, again, great question, Emily. Um, we have a lot of volunteers who are, are drone experts. Um, so we'd love to have uh, their uh, have their expertise uh, um, as part of our, our roster as well. Um, and then beyond the, the folks who go out into the field, uh, we also have um, a remote response team who um, can do a lot of uh, their functionality without having to, to leave the comfort of their own homes. Um, and they can still provide a lot of value through project management, through um, monitoring where there are unmet needs um, and helping us to mobilize our volunteers, uh, as well as to coordinate logistics, um, uh, help desk and, and monitor the status of the sites that we install. Um, HR, marketing, finance, like I said, we're a standard organization, so there's there's a lot of opportunities to help across the organization. And then I'm actually just going to run through the, these next few slides. These were really just um, backup slides, um, but these are uh, just photos of some of the other uh, disasters that we've done uh, in the past. Um, so Tubbs Fire, Mendocino Fires, a lot of fires, uh, the Camp Fire. Um, so I don't know if any of you used to live in California, but um, this was one of the the disasters that really stuck with me um, because of the scale of uh, the the disaster impact um, in in that area. It was a really it's a small town, um, but uh, this used to be a, a supermarket, um, and and you can see that there wasn't a lot left after the after the wildfire went through there. Um, so we were able to help them with their donations management. So um, a lot of people donated toys um, so that the kids could have. Um, it's kind of some some semblance of comfort, um, and we also help them with their uh, their tech uh, infrastructure to to help manage all the um, uh, all the donations that they were getting in. Um, and then again, shelters uh, for all the people who were displaced from their homes that had burned, um, and uh, making sure that they had a way to communicate. Um, and then also making, we were also supporting a nonprofit who was helping with the medical side of recovery there. Um, so this is, um, uh, this lady was from a, a nonprofit called Medspire um, and they were founded really to provide uh, medical care because the hospital in the area uh, had, had, had uh, burned uh, and closed uh, and a clinic there as well. Um, so they were trying to provide medical services uh, in the area um, and we were kind of helping them with their whole um, uh, back in trying to help them uh, keep track of their their medical records um, uh, and uh, keep track of their patient flow and, and uh, things like that. So just to summarize, um, we there are a lot of different things that we can help with, um, but uh, we typically um, uh, work in the life safety area, mass care, community recovery, so shelters um, and, and libraries and schools. Uh, that's a big thing for us. Um, we typically provide mobile command centers. Um, internet and Wi-Fi is, is probably the, the, the biggest thing that we offer. Um, phones, laptops and tablets, printers and radios as well. Um, and then we, we often work with uh, government agencies and first responders, uh, nonprofits, uh, including uh, schools, shelters, libraries, churches and community centers uh, and medical facilities uh, as well. Um, and uh, again, volunteers are definitely welcome. Uh, volunteer at itdrc.org. Um, if you are interested in um, getting outdoor uh, Wi-Fi set up uh, at your library um, or expanding Wi-Fi coverage inside your library um, or uh, uh, adding coverage to a community center or to a low-income housing center, um, let us know. Uh, we'd love to help where we can. Um, Project Connect is, is itdrc.org slash Project Connect is um, the way to, to um, find out more, you can see photos, more photos of the installations that we've done there. Um, you can submit a request form uh, on that website as well. Um, we are trying to sunset this program uh, actually in this calendar year. Um, so if you're interested, I, I would encourage you to uh, uh, submit uh, those requests uh, as early as we can, as you can, and, and we'll try to get uh, um, a crew out there uh, uh, before we sunset this program. Um, 
And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can also email us at support at itdrc.org um, is how you would do that. Um, uh, or if you want to give us a call, um, it, we do have a, a phone number, 866-217-5777. And that is pretty much it. So um, I really appreciate uh, all of you. Um, I, I guess I should, um, Johnny, you're still on the line. So um, I, I should probably toss it to Johnny. Johnny, did you, was there anything that you wanted to add um, to this? Uh, no, I think you, you covered uh, most everything, you know, just main thing is if anyone has any questions again uh, after after going this, uh, or, you know, or I, I believe they're recording it, so there'll be a replay available. So if, uh, if anyone has questions, certainly let us know. We'd love to coordinate and help you out where we can. All right, so I guess we'll pass it back to uh, Emily or Daryl, or we're happy to answer any questions uh, if we still have folks on the line. All right, thanks guys. Um, just as a reminder, we, we did record uh, today's session. Um, we will stick around for any questions. Um, yeah, we appreciate you guys doing this for us. Absolutely, thank you so much for, for having us. And we're really excited to um, to help to bring the, the resources uh, we have to bear um, to, to Florida and to work with all your uh, libraries and librarians. Sorry to spring that question about the drone clubs on you. Yeah, that was a great question. I, I appreciated that. You know, that actually is a very good question. I actually uh, am a, uh, a budding drone hobbyist myself. I'm in the process of going through getting my uh, 107 certificate as we speak. So um, that's, uh, you know, it's been a newer program for us, but if, you know, if there are, you know, like I said, drone clubs are such out there, um, you know, we'd love to, uh, to talk with them and you know if some of those would uh you know some participants would be interested in you know possibly assisting with the organization too um you know if, if, if there's any one out there that like, like me likes to do disaster response uh you know, certainly uh, like justin said you know ITT, uh, itdrc.org is a great spot to go right down there at the bottom of the main page is you know a spot where you can sign up uh, you know whether it's you know if you're looking to do disaster response type stuff or uh, as Dustin mentioned, you know, there's lots of opportunities, even more so on, you know, administrative side or remote support. So if they're, uh, you know, and seeing this information, if there's anyone out there that says, hey, you know, I'd, I'd like to be able to contribute as well. Um, we're always looking for additional volunteers. Currently in the state of Florida, we've got about 135 uh, in the state of Florida, but we're, you know, that's constantly growing and we're you know, always looking for more people to you know, be willing to give a hand. Um, just wanted to reiterate again how uh, grateful we are to both you, Dustin, and you, Johnny, for agreeing to do this and um, being here today. This was a wonderful presentation. I've learned so much about ITDRC more than I knew already. Um, and so just again, Emily and I would just like to thank you for being here and thank, thank everyone who attended and uh, the CE team and everyone. <laughs> yes, thank you guys so much. Great. Thank you for organizing this. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully you won't need to call us um, after a, a disaster. But uh, if you do have any needs, uh, you know how to get a hold of us. Definitely. <laughs>